Lessons of faith, lessons of faith. It's a topic that touches every one of us, doesn't it? Because we are all dealing with faith, the Christian faith. You, you can't know Christ without faith. You'll never come to God without faith. You'll never continue to grow and mature in grace without faith. And it's not your faith, let me remind you, it's faith whose author and perfecter is Jesus Christ. He initiated it. He knows all about your faith. He knows the ins and outs of your faith. He knows how great a faith you have or how little of a faith we all have at times. Some of the sayings of Christ in dealing with his disciples is, is what? O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. Christ has come to increase faith. And I, I think I speak for all of us when I say more is good and it's here. More is good and it's here. You see, faith is the key do doctrine of the Christian life, isn't it? Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, or evidence, as some translations will say. Someone has once said that Faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but obeying in spite of consequence. Just a reminder of what we finished up with last week. Faith is confidence that God's word is true. And co conviction that acting on that word will bring about God's blessing. God will always bless obedience to his word. Mark it in your heart. And in your mind, God will always bless obedience. And, and oftentimes we don't always see the blessings that God would bestow upon his children. The last time we were together, last week, we began by looking at what it means for our faith to be proven by the works that we do. Faith in action, by our doing and acting upon the word of God, out of obedience. All of us are called to obedience, by the way. All of us are called to obedience. You can't live in faith, by faith, without obedience to God's word. Because any time that obedience is lacking in our faith, why, we have little faith. Little faith. By our doing and acting upon the word of God, this is putting our faith into practice. That's what James is addressing here. He said, show me your faith without saying a word. You know, I, I see some of that stuff on social media. Uh, t tell me you're a, a, a deer hunter uh, without telling me you're a deer hunter, okay? Stuff like that. You know what they're saying, right? T tell me you're a person of faith without telling me you're a person of faith. That's what James is actually saying. There are all kinds of idioms that we use in our English language to define such things. And he's telling us, uh, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by works. We have drawn from James's teaching three kinds of faith that I borrowed from Warren Wiersbe. I took his outline there. Dead faith, demonic faith, and dynamic faith. Yesterday, uh, later in the morning, I, I heard a woman's voice coming from the direction of the parking lot outside of my office. And I looked out the window and I saw a woman with the back of her car opened and throwing out a jack on the ground and while talking on her phone. That's what I heard. She was talking to somebody on the other end, of course. I, I think she was anyway. It makes sense. So, so I, I went out and, and asked her if I, if I could help. And then I went to work changing her flat tire and, and uh, on her car. And she thanked me several times and she went on her way. And now, now, what do you think, what do you suppose she would have thought if I, I, I would have gone out and said to her, uh, oh, I see that you have a flat tire. Um, it, it looks like it might be difficult to change out, by the way. Very difficult. It, it did look difficult. Well, I, I'm the pastor of the church here, and, and I pray that the Lord will, will, will help you out or, or send the help that you need, and uh, have a great day. And walk inside, huh? What type of testimony now would that have been of the Christian faith? What type of faith would that have demonstrated to that woman? Huh? Oh, I'm sure had I walked away from her that she would have either attempted to, to change the tire to the best of her ability or she would have called someone to come and help her. But in either case, either case, I would not have been a good testimony of Christ nor demonstrated true faith. And James teaches us here he says that, so, so also faith by itself is, if it does not have works, is 
dead. It's dead. It's deceased. It's not active. It's not alive. And, and if faith, if a person says they have faith, and, and yet that faith is defined as being dead because of lack of works, can that faith save them? James goes to that, doesn't he? That, that's, a, that's a head jerk backwards, isn't it? Someone grabbing you right by the nap of the neck and pulling you into reality here. Do you really think you have saving faith if, if you have no demonstration of your faith, only that which is spoken or verbal? There are a lot of verbal Christians in our world today. Some are even politicians that may quote a verse of Scripture now and then. And everybody thinks, oh my goodness, they're Christians. They got my vote. <laughs> and in the next breath, they, they say something really stupid or their actions reveal their true heart. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, you do. You. You, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so we discussed last week dead faith. What good is it? And we pick up with point two, demonic faith. And I, I covered half of this point. I, I probably should have stopped before I got to it so that it wouldn't confuse you. But I went and I cut the whole section out that I, that I didn't want to repeat to make sure I didn't repeat it again. All right? Because I would have. But someone will say, James says, chapter 2, verses 18, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. He's saying James gets the attention of his audience because he goes on in verse 19 to say, you believe that God is one, you do well. Or, or actually he's saying, that's great. That's really good for you. Good for you. you. You believe that God is one. Great. Even the demons believe. And they are extremely afraid. They tremble and they shudder. So James gets the attention of his audience by mentioning demons. And, and, and it's funny, the world is talking a lot about the supernatural realm and demons this and demons that, while the church is kind of going quiet on the thing, you know? Why do we do that in culture and history repeating itself? And, and the church should be emphasizing the fact that, yeah, there is a supernatural realm. There is a heavenly place. And, and, and Satan is the leader of that, the prince and power of the air of darkness. And there are demons who are allowed to... to possess and to oppress people. There are. There is activity in the spiritual realm. You say, well, Pastor, you're getting a little tippy now, going off the rails just a little. No, I think you are if you don't believe that. Actually, I would question you. And so he gets the attention of his audience by mentioning demons, and he compares the belief of one who does not possess saving faith to the belief of a demon. Paul says, um, when he's talking about the law, and he says, I would not have known that, that coveting was a sin until the law said, you shall not covet. And then he says, then I realize from that alone, I'm full of sin. And Paul goes on to stress the point that coveting is demonic. It's demon worship, idolatry. So some pretty important stuff here for us to be considering and thinking about, huh? Wouldn't you say? You believe in, in that God is one? Uh, you do well. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Godly Jews, godly Jews, and didn't say Christian Jews, godly Jews believe this truth about God. All, most all Jews believe this one truth about God. The Lord God, the Lord is one. It was an assertion of their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet they needed to be brought to a saving faith as well. You believe that God is one good. The demons believe the same thing and are extremely afraid of Christ. That's what the, the Greek translation of that tremble or shudders means. It gives a sense of somebody who is totally shaken in such fear they don't know what to do. Well, that's what the demons do. They believe in God. They know what the Word says. They believe in God, but they obviously can do nothing about it, right? They can't do anything about it. Demons cannot be saved. I remember years ago watching uh, a famous uh, television show that so many people fell in love with, so many Christians just flocked to watch, and it became their second Bible, touched by an angel. You say, oh, pastor, you're not going to touch that. Oh, yeah, I am. 
I watched that one evening. I was watching it, and I don't know why. I must have lost my mind or something. I've never been into that stuff. And it showed this one, one angel, fallen angel, who had betrayed and fallen when Lucifer fell. And at the end of the program, uh, she was going in to talk to Jesus to reconsider her life. Demons can't do that, by the way. They're lost forever. They can never be reinstated, reestablished, reconciled back to God. They know that. They know that. And, and they want to inhabit human beings in a form of escapism, but it's not going to work. It can't work. Hmm. You believe that God is one, that's pretty good. You should fear. James is literally saying you, you, should, you should tremble then if you do not have a saving faith. You should be afraid. The emphasis here is in the works that follow faith. It's what James is addressing. Identified by what we do. By what we do. Our actions must be aligned to what we say we believe. And you know, if you've known me for any time at all, you know that it gets right underneath my skin. When I see Christians who claim to be Christians and they have nothing about their actions, nothing about their conversation that says, I live by faith. Nothing. You say, well, now, pastor, don't judge. And I would say to you, don't take Scripture out of context when you say that. Because as Christians in the household of faith, we are to watch out for one another and to judge one another's walk with God. Oh, great. Now he's pointing at me. No, I'm not. But we are. In the house of God, I need to be concerned about your walk with God. You should be concerned about mine as well. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be concerned about that. And that's not judging, by the way. That's not judging. That's the world's stance of, of, of keeping you away from truth, keeping you from pointing at their sin. Don't judge me. <laughs> Don't judge me. Yeah, and if you're a Christian, you say that to me, man, that just makes my skin crawl. You say that. It just, it just turns me inside out. Yeah, it does. So don't say it after church to me just to be funny. All right? Some of you will. I know you will. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you. God loves you a lot more than I do. He does. I even say that to my kids. I love my kids. God loves them more than I do. You love your kids too. God loves them more than you do. He does. We need to get this understanding about faith. You know, this isn't some happy-go-lucky, tiptoeing through the tulips type of Christianity and faith. We don't pick it up and put it down when we want to. We are commanded by Christ to have faith. He told his disciples, have faith in God. Have faith in God. And he measures that faith out to us. Our faith is qualified now in the sequence of our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Our faith is qualified in sequence of our thoughts, our words, and our actions. <laughs> How we live. How are we living? It reveals who we are in Jesus Christ, to whom we belong. Our, our thoughts, our words, our actions should define to the world around us that, that we are not like the world. We are like Christ Jesus. We must be like Him. To claim to have faith and not have works that follow that faith is a sin of omission. Omission. Omission is a sin of willingly, now, willingly not performing a right action as in comparison to the sin of commission. What's the sin of commission? Which is willingly performing a wrong action. So we have the sins of omission and the sins of commission. So have you ever thought to yourself, oh, I had an opportunity to share Jesus with that person and I, I just didn't do it. Well, you know, God knows my heart and he, he'll probably give me another opportunity. No, you had an opportunity and you didn't take that opportunity. The sin of omission. The sin to do the right thing and you didn't do it. The sin of commission is being tempted by sin and you go ahead and you carry out that sin in your life. That's the sin of commission. So maybe when you repent during the day, like we all should, probably every day, by the way, oh, he's judging me again. 
We should pray for the Lord to forgive us of the sins of omission and commission. And you can tell him I said so. <laughs> sins of omission and commission. James addresses this. James addresses a lot of things. James 4, 17. He said, so whoever knows the right thing to do, and this is also implying, oh, the wrong, not the wrong thing to do, and, and does not the right thing to do and fails to do it, it is sin. For him, it is sin. And when they see the words brothers or hymns, it's referring to both brothers and sisters and hymns and hers. All right, here? Referring to hymns and hers. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Oh, I know this isn't right. I, I, I shouldn't be going 10 miles over the speed limit. <laughs> He's saying, get off the clothesline and move on, brother. But we as Christians now, as Christians, you say, well, well, you know, faith is something that's personal. No, it's not. Your faith is not personal. Your relationship to Jesus Christ is on the surface level, but it goes much deeper than that. Our faith is, is to be revealed to the world around us. We belong to Jesus. We belong to the eternal kingdom of which he is the eternal king of. We belong to him. We don't belong to the, the, this old world anymore. We don't belong to the old beggarly elements of the world that we once wandered around in, uh, fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and all kinds of things. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2. We've been redeemed. We've been sanctified. We've been saved. We've been forgiven a new name in heaven. We've been given, been given the new us, or you, I should say, in Jesus Christ. If you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, the slate has been cleaned. But you still have to repent of sin. We've been created as Christians now to do good works. Works should follow our faith. Works should never precede faith because then you'd be trying to earn your Christianity. You can't do that. It tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we, talking to the church now, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. God prepared the good works beforehand, and we should walk in them, not when we choose to. I feel good today. I've had my coffee. You know, the kids are off to school. You know, the Ira's doing good. You know, I feel really good. I'm going to walk in goodness today. I'm just going to cheer everybody up with a nice, bright, smiley, hello, how are you? But then by the end of the day, if you're going by your feelings alone, you're going to be mopey, you're going to be dopey, you're going to be Eeyore coming home. Yeah. That's what it will be if you're going by your feelings. When we look at what we are commanded to do, we must respond to that command as Christians now out of obedience to the word. Obedience to the word. Not obedience to your feelings, which are narcissistic if you want the truth, and damnable, but to Him. We have to be obedient to Jesus Christ at every level, by the way. So we are His workmanship. <laughs> he's still working on us. Thank God He's working on some of you. <laughs> huh? You can say that about me. I don't care. <laughs> Well, we thank God he's still working on you, and boy, yeah, yeah. We are his workmanship, and, and here's the good thing about it. We've been created in Christ Jesus. But we had to come to Christ to get there, didn't we? Before, before the cross, before coming to Christ to become born again, right? I was not in Christ Jesus, and neither were you. I don't care how many good deeds you did how many wonderful things you did, how good-natured you are. Without Jesus Christ, you're not going to heaven because you would be trying to earn it through works of your personality and character. Let me remind you of what our dear old prophet Isaiah said about you and me. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. What kind of picture do you get in your mind when you hear about filthy rags? Well, I'm going to define it for you. You might think of a mechanic's rag, right? Always dirty. Yeah. No, it's not what it's talking about. See, in the Old Testament, there were sacrifices for clean and unclean things, right? 
And when a woman went through her menstrual cycle, she had to spend time after that uh, doing the, the, the rites of uh, uncleanness. So you can guess what those rags are that, that Isaiah is talking about. But any time a person thinks that they can come to God on their own merits, that's what they are. Filthy rags. And, man, that's... Uh, when a person does that, let me, let me help you with this a little deeper. When a person thinks that they can earn their way to God, pay some form of penance, and earn their way to God, they are off-stepping the cross of Jesus Christ. They are saying to the Father, you're a fool because you let your son die when I could have made it on my own. That's what they're saying. God hates that, you know. God hates that. Jesus died to bear my sins, my righteousness. Took him to the cross. Your righteousness took him to the cross. And he died there. And God raised him up on the third day. Jesus was the only official sacrificial lamb, the only one who could die on that cross. That cross was chosen for the Son of God. Not, not Isaac from way, way back 4,000 years before Christ would die on the cross. God had a plan even back then when he, took, he, he told Abraham, take your son, your only son, your only begotten son, and sacrifice him to me. Right? God had another plan. God never called for child sacrifice except his own. And that's what he did. That's what he did. So being a Christian involves trusting Christ and living for Christ. You receive the life, and then you reveal the life in the way that we live. Let's talk about dynamic faith for just a few moments. Justified by faith. It tells us here in James 2, 20 to 26, you want to be shown, you foolish person, <laughs> that faith apart from works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead also. So James assigns a description to the person now claiming to have faith without works, foolish or senseless. The person is foolish or senseless who claims to have faith and they, they don't have any works. Um, while it might be theoretically possible to have faith without works, James says such a faith is useless. It's useless. It means nothing. Dynamic faith is faith that is real. Real faith. Faith that is real. Faith that has power. Faith that results in a changed life. That's dynamic faith. Dynamic faith changes a person. The transforming power of God steps into an individual's life and they are changed. You become sanctified, set apart, and holy as unto the Lord. You become the people of God that Israel was destined to be back under the Old Covenant. God wanted a people for Himself, and they just could not bear up under the law. God made a way through the cross. And so through the cross of Jesus Christ, we now, upon accepting by faith, by grace, Jesus, we have become God's people, God's sons and God's daughters. We belong to Him. And we are to live this dynamic faith, the faith that is real, faith that has power, faith that results in a changed life. We need to be changed. We say to sinners when they, they come in, God wants you to come just the way you are, and we must follow that up with the condition. But God wants to change you. Thank God He didn't leave you or me the way we were when we came to faith in Christ. He changed us. 
He changed the way I think. He changed the way I feel. He changed my conversation. He changed the way I do things. I deal with those things. The temptation is all those things that I had to give to God, I deal with them every day, and you do too. It becomes that inward battle between the flesh and the spirit. But He has changed us, and we we pursue Christ daily through His Word and through prayer that the imprint of Christ upon our heart will be revealed in the way that we live and speak to the world that we belong to Him. We belong to Him. James described this true saving faith to begin with. Dynamic saving faith is based on the Word of God. Dynamic saving faith is based on the Word of God. We receive our spiritual rebirth through God's Word. It tells us that in James 1.18. We receive the Word and this saves us. Yeah. James 1.21 says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The word is cleansing. The word is salvation. I can say that because I know some of you are thinking, no, Jesus Christ is the one that saves us. Jesus said that he was in the beginning with God, didn't he? And he was the logos. Jesus was the word, the logos of God. So when we refer to the Word, we're also referring to Jesus Christ here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, who created all things. And then it jumps down, I think, into verse 14 of John's Gospel, chapter 1. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that talking about? It's talking about our Savior, Jesus. The Word became flesh. Romans 10, 17, you all know well. Now then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Yes, by the word of God. James gives us illumination by illustration again in our text, chapter 2. James used Abraham and Rahab as illustrations of dynamic saving faith. Since both of them heard and received the message of God through his word. Through his word. Oh, what a relationship Abraham had with God. What faith Rahab had in her own life and heart, considering the lifestyle that she lived, to then have faith in God speaks of the wonderful forgiveness of God, doesn't it? And then later on she would be named in the line of Christ. huh? (laughs) In the lineage of Christ. To better understand the point that James is drawn out here. We need to take a look at what Abraham is praised for just as he is about to offer up Isaac, his only son, as a sacrifice in obedience to what God had commanded him. In Genesis 22 and verse 12, the angel of the Lord forbids Abraham to stretch out his hand against his only son. Why? Why? The angel says this, For now I know that you are one who fears God since you have not withheld your son, your only child, from me. Abraham was going to carry it out. He was going to kill his son. Why? Because God told him to. And you know, now, now Abraham was nothing like Western culture, present day church, and looked at God and said, why would you have me do that? Why would you ask me to do that? Oh, I know that there are some things about you that are mystery. I I get it. But why would you want me, Abraham, who believes you and trusts you, to offer my son? I need some answers, God. I just defined every one of us, didn't I? Because we've done that at times. I don't understand why God allowed this to happen. And we don't, child of God. We don't understand everything. And it's heartbreaking in situations that we don't understand everything. But Abraham never questioned God. Never questioned God. He said to Sarah, I'm taking the boy with me in the morning and a few servants. We're going on a journey. He didn't question God. He began to make plans for the journey instantly. Oh, did he probably put in a sleepless night? Probably. Probably he toiled 
a lot with that, just thinking about it. And then there's a part of me that thinks maybe he didn't because he was trusting God. He was trusting God. So the angel of the Lord stopped him. Uh, it, it, it is not this act of faith, it is not that this act of faith, rather, has somehow won Abraham some superior level of justification before God. That one act alone doesn't do that. Rather, Abraham's act has made it plain for anyone to see that Abraham was all in. With what God said, I'm going to do it. I will do it. The only other person in Scripture that I see that in their life is Jesus. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. He didn't come to make, make friends and create social groups for coffee and book reading. He came to do the will of the Father, and he knew what the will of the Father was, to go to Golgotha, to go to Calvary. Why? Because he saw lost souls all around him throughout creation who needed redemption, and he knew that he was the only connection back to the Father to do that. He came with the sole purpose of fulfilling God's will and to save his people from their sins. That's what he's come to do. And if you're a Christian, you're one of them. Isn't that great? Huh? God chose you. Yeah, he did. He knew your name way back before the foundation of the world was. Now you think about that. Drives the scientists nuts. Abraham withholds nothing from God. Not a thing. Not even Sarah's own biological son. The son of promise. The son of promise. He could have fallen on his knees and pleaded with God, but you promised. <laughs> Offering up his son has provided incontrovertible evidence of Abraham's faith. He never questioned God. In verses 22 to 23 of our text, James makes a connection back to the faith that was credited to Abraham as righteousness. We find that in Genesis 15 and verse 6. Abraham's works now show a practical application of his faith and led to a perfecting of that faith. You get that? Listen to this. Abraham's works show a practical application of his faith and led to a perfecting of that faith. It needed work. Your faith and my faith need work. A perfecting of that. Your faith needs to be proven, and so does my faith. Actually, if you go back to the first chapter of James, right? Count it all joy, brothers and sisters. When you encounter trials of various kinds, it says here, for you know that the testing or proving of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. All of us are in the process of that perfecting faith. You are, wherever you are in your journey with Christ, you're in the process of your faith being perfected, and God knows exactly what you need to perfect that faith. Isn't that great? God's got it all figured out. We need to be like Abraham and just sit back and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. But man, when the human aspect of our nature gets involved, we begin to worry, we begin to fret, we begin to find ways of solu or solutions and, and, and try to figure it all out and, and contact this person, contact that person. And, and then when all of the possibilities have been completely exhausted, we go to prayer. That's what I do sometimes. Hmm. The kind of faith that justifies someone before God is faith that can be seen. Faith that can be seen is the faith that justifies an individual before God. Faith that can be seen. It is faith that is put into practice, not, not the useless kind that is only spoken of. Yeah. You know, when you hear people speak of their faith, that they believe in God, and yet you, you probably know in your heart that they're, they're not. Don't get angry with them. Pity them. Pray for them. Share Jesus with them. Share true, saving faith with them. Take them the next step beyond believing in God to believe in God. 
to trust him. So many in the world today like that, so many. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19 gives us a, a picture of Abraham here, and I want you to see this, and I'm almost done. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said of Isaac, now, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Listen to what it says about Abraham in 11.19 of Hebrews. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, the Scripture says, he did receive him back. You know what that says? You know what that says of Abraham's faith? God saw Abraham's heart. God saw Isaac already offered. Abraham would have offered his son, and by God stopping him, Abraham was receiving Isaac back as though he was coming back from the dead. Isn't that great? No. you got to get that, really. That is awesome. That's awesome. God saw Abraham was so in it with him that no question about it, when he stopped him, he brought him back from the dead. That's awesome. That's great. That's great. Then we have Rahab. Huh? And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she, when, she, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. That was faith. Her life was spared. Her family was spared. And, and she went on to be in the line of Christ. That's awesome how God does that. You know, God, the people hanging around Jesus are, are people like you and me. Common, broken people. <laughs> people who need a savior, people who feel insignificant. And Jesus steps in and he gives to us the greatest significance that you will ever have this side of heaven. He makes you a son or a daughter of the Most High God. That wonderful, what he's done. Oh, bless his holy name. So in conclusion, faith is a key doctrine in the Christian life. And faith is only is only as good as its object. It's only as good as its object. Dynamic faith is based on God's Word, and it involves the whole man, the whole person. Dead faith touches only the intellect. Demo demonic faith involves both the mind and the emotions, but dynamic faith involves the will, our will. And that will, I'll tell you what's going to happen to your will. It will be surrendered. It has to be surrendered but God will work through your will to surrender your will to follow him till your will becomes his will that's what he does that's what he does I don't want my will I might think I know everything I don't really I, I might think I want it all my way but I really don't how many of you heard people say I wouldn't want to win the mega bucks just ruin a person you're lying you are such a liar you want that money. Come on. Let's admit it. Forgive us for lying, God. Or don't sit and tell me, I would give half of that to the church. <laughs> yeah, I had a guy come up to me one night many years ago. Many years ago. Uh, probably for most of you who are even here. And he comes up to me. He's, he's standing right here. He says to me, I play, I play the, the, the megabucks. I do. And he said, I promised God. Now, this man was not a Christian. <laughs> he says, I promised God, Pastor, that if I win, I'm going to give my tithes to you, the church. I said, I hope you win. Because <laughs> I'd take it. And use it for the glory of God. <laughs> I, I told that to my brother one time, and he almost passed out. You, <laughs> you would? You would take that? <laughs> Yeah, I would, yeah. No, just as soon as I would if the police department called me up and said, Pastor York, we want to give all this money that we've collected from criminals over the years to your church, I'd be down there in a heartbeat to put it to work for the kingdom. That's what God does. What, God, what others have intended for evil, God can use it for good. Amen? Amen? Amen. So the whole person plays a part in true saving faith. The mind understands the truth. The heart desires the truth. And the will acts upon the truth. All about the truth, isn't it? 
No, faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is obeying in spite of consequence. True saving faith needs, leads to action. How are you doing? In your personal life, how are you doing with that? Dynamic faith leads to obedience. How are you doing there? And I, I only ask that question because I ask them to myself. We should ask each other these questions. How are you doing? Is your life so busy that you, you don't think that you have time to be obedient to what God may be calling you to by faith? Or, or maybe you find that you are going by more of your feelings. When you feel good and things seem right and the, the stars have aligned, then we will do something in faith. No, no, child of God, please, please don't think like that. Dynamic faith leads to obedience on the part of our will. I will. And this obedience is not an isolated event. It can't be. It can't be sporadic. It, it continues throughout the whole life. It will continue throughout your life. Progressive sanctification at work in the heart and life of the believer. God's truth being embedded a little bit here and a little bit there as we walk with him and trust him to live by faith. To walk by faith and not by sight. Trust him. Amen.